Well, good morning and welcome to worship. It is so good to see you gathered here for the worship of God on this Sunday morning. It's especially good to see those of you who are our guests. We appreciate you taking your time to worship with us as well. If you're first time with us this morning, please grab one of those little cards that are in front of you and fill out the information so we can have a record of your visit. Your visit. And if you'll drop it in the offering plates, um, one on each, um, one at the front and one over here, as you leave, um, we would appreciate that very much. Those of you joining us by Facebook, thank you. Just let us know you're out there by typing in your city. We'd appreciate that very, very much. It is always good to gather with God's people to worship the Lord together. Let's stand together and greet each other in the name of Christ in whatever way you feel comfortable. And this is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. I have just two announcements for us this morning, and like usual, I'm going to go straight through them. Uh, this Thursday at 7 p.m., there is a nominating committee meeting. So if you are part of the nominating committee, uh, please note that you have a meeting this Thursday at 7 p.m. At the end of worship next Sunday, there'll be somebody stationed at the front door of the sanctuary and the side door near the office to collect pocket change for our Change Gang ministry. Uh, the funds that we raise here are used uh, to buy Christmas presents for the children at the Baptist Children's Homes of North Carolina. So uh, make sure before you come in that next morning to go out in that little spot in your car. We all have that little spot in our car where we have a ton of change. Just grab a handful of that, shove it in your pocket, and, and bring it in uh, for that offering to worship again next Sunday. If you feel led to give as an act of worship this morning, uh, we have our offering stations over here by the door, um, by the office, and one in the back in the narthex. So if you feel led to give as an act of worship uh, on your way out, you're more than welcome to drop uh, your offering to God into those offering plates. Y'all, that's all the announcements I have yet again. So another quick week of announcements. So let's turn our hearts to worship this mor morning with our moment of meditation. Uh, it's called The Call to Worship, and it's in the form of a responsive reading. Uh, I'll read the first part in the fine print, and then we can follow along and read together in unison in the bold print. Come and worship Christ, the visible image of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation, the eternal God, the one through whom all things were created and in whom all things are held together. This is our God. Let's worship together. Hymn number 261, Wonderful Words of Life. Let's stand together as we sing.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through, 10, through 20. I'll be reading them out loud for us. We can follow along on the screens behind me or in the Bibles in the pew pockets in front of you. Colossians 1, beginning in verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If I can have all of our children come up for our children's time this morning. Well, good morning, Ainsley. How are you this morning? Good. All right. So I'm very glad you're here today, and I think you're really going to enjoy this. So I wanted to introduce you to a friend that I brought with me this morning. He's sitting right here. Do you see him? He's, he's right here on this step. You see him? Oh, you do see him. Okay. Well, that's crazy, because I'm, I'm pretty sure I forgot to mention that he is invisible. You can't see him, right? Okay, but that's fine. That's fine. All right, do you think you could tell everybody in the church what he looks like? Yeah. You could tell him what he looks like? What does he look like? Uh, he looks like a dinosaur. He looks like a dinosaur. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think he looks like a dinosaur. But, but of course, you can't see what he looks like because he's invisible. So I'll tell you what. Let's think about it like this. All right, so he looks exactly like my dad. He, exactly. He looks exactly like my dad. Now, do you remember what my dad looks like? Yeah. What does my dad look like? He looks like a dinosaur. He looks like a dinosaur, too? No, no. I think <laughs> my dad kind of, you know, you might not remember what my dad looks like, but he looks like me. He has a little less hair on top. His, his beard is a little grayer than mine is, you know. Does He has one just like me. That's just like my dad. So if my dad, if my invisible friend looks just like my dad, who looks just like me, then my invisible friend has probably brown hair like I do. He has a black beard like I do. He probably has brown eyes like me, doesn't he? So he looks just like that. Now, that was the same problem that Paul had when he was trying to tell the Colossians about God. Now, the Colossians were Greek Christians, and although they knew a lot about Jesus, they didn't know much about the God of Israel. And so when Paul wanted to tell them about God, he told them that Jesus was the image of the invisible God. He knew that if they, would, uh, if they knew about Jesus, then they would know all about God. And then they would remember to look at Jesus, and we'll find out exactly what God looks like. Let's say a prayer about that this morning, and then we'll go to Children's Church, okay? Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you uh, for bringing us here today so that we can learn more about you. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who is the image, who through him we can see you, and he is the image of the invisible God. Help us to always think of Jesus when we think of you, and help us to have a great day today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen.
Let's pray together. Holy Father, we are grateful for all your gifts today. We are grateful for your mercies and grace poured out on us through Christ Jesus. We are grateful for the wonderful promises of Scripture that you are with us. You are with us when we are joyful in the morning and wake with a smile on our face, excited to greet the day. You are with us when we would rather not get out of bed at all. You are with us when we don't want to greet anyone or anything else. You sustain us when we are weak. You hold us together when we feel like we are going to fall apart. Through your infinite power and grace, you have given us Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And in the power of the Spirit, we are comforted and blessed. You have called us together to be your people so that we might comfort one another in times of trial. And all of these gifts, we are truly blessed. And today, we are grateful. And for the times where we forget just how precious these gifts are, give us gracious hearts for the gifts you have provided. And draw us together as we hear the scriptures today. Help us to be amazed by the Christ we serve and live in wonder that he is on our side. For we make this prayer in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Spirit. Amen. Good morning, everybody. It's, it's always a great pleasure to sing and use the talents that God has given us, but it makes me uh, feel a lot better when I got my wife and my daughter up here. And now we had a fourth. Uh, we had Ray to the mix, and we just uh, we, we sung this song, and it just kind of clicked with us, and we hope you all enjoy it this morning. <coughs> I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away, when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away, just a when this life is old, I'll fly away, fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away in the morning.
Let's pray together. And now, O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. One of the things that happens when you get married is you inherit a family. Uh, Molly and I got married. I married essentially in... in Let me try that in English this time. Molly and I were married, and I got a new family, and so did she. I got into the rushing family. And so when that happens in your life, you develop a whole new list of sayings and a list of ways of doing things, and they're all to be learned, and, and they're interesting and fun. Well, one of the new sayings I have become aware of from the rushing family is the saying, a little baby come apart. And I had I had never heard that phrase before, but... Molly's mom uses that phrase when Abby is really having what I would have referred to as a meltdown. She's having, she's having a little baby come apart. I think that sounds much nicer than a, she's having a temper tantrum or having a meltdown. She's having a little baby come apart. And, of course, what she means by that is, for some reason, Abby is losing her mind. She might be hungry. She might be thirsty. She might be having growing pains. Or, as Abby has learned to say in the last couple of weeks, I'm mad. <laughs> Ainsley had them too, and you know, it's just the way of children. They, they have those moments when they cry inconsolably about something, and for the life of you, you can't figure it out. Well, that, in the rushing family, is a little baby come apart. Well, as it turns out, most of us have had those, not just as babies, but as an adult. Have you ever felt like you would like to have a come apart have you ever felt like you want, needed one of those? Some of us, um, it, and I find this especially among women, feel like every now and then you just need a good cry. I have never understood this. Never. It's the whole Steel Magnolias thing. For those of you who are disconnected from that movie, Steel Magnolias is a famous movie that many women watch when they feel like they need a good cry. I think life makes me tearful enough from time to time. I don't need a movie to do that, and certainly I don't want a movie to make me cry. Ah. But men tend to do it differently, at least the men I'm familiar with. We tend to get mad, and so we might go hit a punching bag when we need to have a little come apart, or we might you know, uh, swing our hardest at golf balls and then make a mess of things and get madder and break the shaft on one of our golf clubs or throw it into the lake. You know, things like that. I've even see, seen people pay $10 to get a sledgehammer and beat on an old used car to get their frustrations out. Sometimes we feel like we're going to fall apart. That is the nature of life. So when we feel that way, how do we keep it together? Jesus Christ keeps us together. If you are having a moment like that, there's something you need to know. You need to have a high view of Jesus Christ. We come to our text today, a beautiful and wonderful text, and the, the scripture that we read is actually older than the letter that Paul wrote. This text, Paul is most likely copying from an early Christian hymn. So this is one of the earliest statements of the Christian faith anywhere predating Paul, most likely. And it talks about Jesus Christ, the image of the invisible God, the creator. Now, we, are, we typically, when we talk about creation, we talk about God as the creator. In the, the creed, the Nicene Creed, I believe in God the Father, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only son. So right there, we attribute the creation of heaven and earth to God as we should. But... Jesus plays a role in the creation. God is the, the origin of the process of creation. But Jesus Christ is, you might call him, the chief engineer. And the text says, it was created through him, by him, and for him. It says he is before all things, the firstborn of creation. Now, you and I hear firstborn and we think, oh, Jesus was born and that makes him, no, that's not what it means. For the ancient mind, the person who was born first was the preeminent one of the family. Sorry, second and third children, the first child is the boss. 
You've always known that, but in the ancient mind, they were totally the boss. And this text is saying that Jesus Christ is preeminent over all creation. He created all things, visible and invisible. And Paul doesn't have a mind here thinking of atoms being invisible. He, he, that's not what's on his mind. He's thinking of spiritual beings and spiritual powers that fulfill the universe that we have no way of contacting. He created everything. Through him, by him, and for him. It all exists because of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to get in your mind this morning your favorite thing, whatever it is. For some of you, your favorite thing is the ocean. And when you're having a, a, a little adult come apart, you want to go to the ocean. You want to dig your feet in the sand, and you want to sit there with a book that you're going to half read and listen to the waves crash. And that's how you hold it together. Who made the ocean? None other than Jesus Christ. Who created the, the way that the waves crash on the shore? Who was it that invented sound waves that hit our ears and make that wonderful sound? Jesus Christ. For some of you, and I know there are many of you here who love to hunt, or at one time in your life love to hunt, and you would get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and fill yourself full of coffee so you can get out on a perfect lake with your duck decoys, and you would listen to the sound of sheer silence as the sun crested over the lake. And in that beauty, you found peace. Who made that? Jesus Christ made that. I know I'm a nerd, and the stories I'm about to tell you will merely confirm my nerddom in your eyes. I get that I'm a nerd. I've always been a nerd. It was many years ago, I think I was in the fifth or sixth grade, and science, it was revealed on Good Morning America that morning that scientists had found a planet not in our solar system, a planet orbiting another star. It was the first time they'd ever seen one. Oh, they knew it was out there, but the first time they'd ever found one. And I was so excited, I went up to a friend of mine named Tiffany, a girl, obviously, and I walked up to her, you'll never guess what was going more America. And I told her, and she looked at me like I had 17 heads. Yes, I'm a nerd. I get it. New telescope has been launched into the heavens, the Webb telescope. If you're into that kind of thing, the sheer magnitude of beauty of what is out there is beyond human imagination. Now, we cannot even conceive of how big this universe is. There was an atheist once said that I can't believe God created all this universe just for us. And I responded, well, he didn't. He created it for him. Who was the one who spun the stars together? Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to consider the wisdom it took. For if the Adam was slightly different in construction, life would be impossible. If water sank when it froze instead of floated, life would be impossible. If the earth were a little closer or a little further away from the sun, life would be impossible. Who was it that did that? His name is Jesus Christ. If you were to ask me what my favorite thing in the world is, I would tell you it would be a perfectly restored 1965 Mustang GT Fastback preferably in candy apple red, although blue with silver racing stripes would come in second. What does that have to do with God? Tell me, beauty is symmetry. There's symmetry and grace in just about everything you see that is beautiful. If you see a human face, the people will tell you the most beautiful human faces are the ones who have the least difference from side to side. Beauty comes in symmetry. In most cases. Where does that idea come from? It came from Jesus Christ. In anything that you find beauty in, it bears the fingerprints of Jesus Christ, whether it's a tree or the ocean or an object of creation, whether it's a, a painting or an automobile, anything in between. 
They are beautiful and wonderful because of Christ Jesus. Consider the wonder that is between your ears. There are more synapses in your brain than there are stars in the Milky Way. Who did that? Jesus Christ. Now, some would, re- would reckon that it is entirely natural and it comes, with part, comes because of a natural process. And I would say, if things evolve over time in their environment, okay, that has, says nothing to do with God. But if you want to tell me that we can get from a primordial ooze to the complexity and beauty of life we have now without divine intervention, I will tell you, you are crazy. It cannot happen. Jesus is the genius behind creation. Jesus is the author of creation's beauty. Jesus is the one to whom all is due. He is due glory and honor and blessing because of who he is and what he has accomplished in the created order alone. There was a popular theory a couple hundred years ago that said that God was like a great clock maker who built the clock and wound it up and put it aside and the clock continues to do its work. This text completely disagrees with that. The world does not function on its own. It is sustained by the Creator. It is sustained by Jesus Christ. And this is not just a one-off in Scripture. It's repeated in Hebrews and Nehemiah and Acts and 1 Corinthians and 2 Peter. Multiple authors across multiple... um, settings across multiple centuries hold the same view. Creation is held together by the one who brought it together. Jesus Christ is infinite in glory and beauty and wisdom and power. I had a teacher one time say that when it comes to a reading of Scripture, you always need to be able to answer the question, so what? So we come to that question. All this is true about Jesus, so what? Remember that the one who did all of that is on your side and is committed to you. He's not committed just to creation in general. And he's not just committed to humanity in general. He is committed to you as an individual right now where you are with all the issues you have in your life today. The same Jesus Christ who spun the stars will sit with you. The same Jesus Christ that came up with the idea of the beauty of a sunset is desiring to make your life beautiful. This Jesus Christ who is God's only son, the beloved, loves you. Now, frequently we gather together and worship on Sunday mornings, and we will talk about our commitment to God. And we will say things like, we need to be committed to the faith. We need to be committed to the work of faith, including worshiping together, studying the scripture, sharing our faith, and praying. praying. We need to be committed to those things because they are right and good. All that is true. But we should talk more frequently than we do about just how committed Jesus Christ is to you. There's a couple of passages in the Gospels, um, one in Matthew and one in Luke, which talk about sparrows. And Jesus says, none of the sparrows of the field can die without your, the Father's concern. And then he says, you are of much more value than any of them. Jesus talks about God knows the number of hairs on our head. As I approach middle age, that number decreases significantly over time. That passage is not just to mean that he knows every detail of my body. He means he knows every intimate detail of my life. He knows me. He knows you. He knows your hopes, your dreams. He knows your heartaches. He knows your frustrations. He knows everything there is to know about you. And he is absolutely committed to you. John 3, 9 says, excuse me, 6, 39 says, 
that none who the Father has given to Jesus Christ will be snatched away from His hand. He is utterly committed to you now. When you feel like you're about to fall apart, know that the Jesus Christ, who is the exalted Son of God, worthy of all things, is on your side, with you, for you, determined to get you to glory, determined to bring out the highest and best good in your life, determined to make you in his image Christ-like. And nothing can snatch you away from him. Jesus will hold you together in moments where you feel like you are about to fall to pieces. Now, when we say something like that, we probably ought to talk about some of the ways that Jesus does this. And one of the ways that Jesus does this is through the community of God, through the people of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 is, uh, well, it's, it's one of those passages that reminds us that the Bible is written for the ear and not the eye. Most people, when the Bible was written, could not read. And so the Bible was designed to be read aloud for a group of people. And if you get a group of people together and read the text silently, they might come up with three or four or five different meanings for the text. But if you read it out loud, the word comforted is said so many times that it simply overwhelms the meaning of the rest of the text. Comforted, 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 comforted. God comforts you and me so that we might be of comfort for other people. We are not just held together to be held together for ourselves. We are held together so we can help hold other people together. Molly is the queen of one-liners and great sayings, and I love them all. But one of them that has really stuck with me over time about the church is, she says, there are some people in this room that when they hug you, you feel like all of your pieces go back together. Yes, yeah, she's right. We are here for each other. Never underestimate that. When you feel like you're falling to pieces, many of us, our first instinct is to withdraw. I, I don't want to see anybody. I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to go anywhere. I just want to sit in my room and eat ice cream. That is exactly backwards of health. When you feel like it the least, you need the people of God the most. When you are tempted to withdraw, what you really need is someone to run to. And it's not enough just to show up because you can still feel lonely just showing up for worship. What needs to happen when you feel like you're going to fall apart is you need to grab someone you know and love and trust and say, I feel like I'm going to fall apart. And tell them the whole story. And let them listen and pray with you and be with you. If someone does you the honor of letting you, letting you in their life like that, don't give them advice. Don't do anything. Listen and pray and love them and tell them you're with them. And that'll be more help than you can possibly imagine. The people of God are here for us. There's something else to pay attention to. Jesus gives us natural means of healing. Now, you know that with your body. A few weeks ago, I was digging post holes in my backyard for the fire pit area I've been working on for about a year. And I developed blisters on my hands. Not uncommon. And right there in the thumb, right there where I was grabbing the post, even though I was wearing gloves, got blisters, no big deal. Just You just wait a few weeks and they get better. And, you know, there's... You can still tell I had blisters if you look. They're gone. The body heals. Is it surprising to you then that the spirit is designed to heal too? And there are natural things that happen. We cry. 
If you feel like crying, you know what you should probably do? You should probably cry. I remember a friend of mine. I became her pastor many years ago, and she told me her story one day. She lost her husband suddenly, and she was not really connected to the church except her mother was deeply faithful. But the pastor found out of her loss, and he kept showing up at her house. And at first it was an annoyance, and then he kept showing up. He became comfortable. And they talked and talked, and one day... With all of that going on, she stumbled across a passage where Jesus lost his friend Lazarus. And the shortest verse in your King James Version of the Bible was, Jesus wept. And she knew right there that Jesus understood her. It's a perfectly good response to trauma. It's healing. We shouldn't run from it. There are other things that are natural that help you Survive trauma. In the Old Testament, there is a great story about a prophet. The prophet has pointed his finger at the evil king, Ahab, and his evil, if there is an evil-er word, I guess you would say more evil wife, Jezebel, and her name rings through human history as the worst of the worst. Even now, if a southern woman calls another woman a Jezebel, you know what that means. Evil king Ahab and his horrible wife Jezebel and he pointed his finger at them and proclaimed the wrath of God and he destroyed their prophets and their altars and Jezebel said I'm going to kill you and the prophet knew he knew she would and so he hightailed it out of town running as fast and far as he could he was met with an angel and he had a meal and he had some rest and eventually he stood in the presence of God I have a psychologist friend who loves to say it this way never underestimate the spiritual power of a snack and a nap sometimes you need to take care of your body meaning when we feel like we're falling apart sometimes we feel we forget to eat when we feel like we're falling apart we get tired And it might just be that our bodies have been pushed so hard that they can't go anymore, and in fact, we need sleep. Tears, hunger, rest. These are signs that God is wanting to put us together. But there is this other thing. There's a supernatural way that God holds us together. Jesus is getting ready to go... To the cross. He is going to leave his disciples. And he says to them, I am not going to leave you orphaned. I am going to give to you another comforter. By that he meant the Holy Spirit. And he points to the Spirit's role as our comforter. The Spirit comforts us with his power. And he is never going to leave us. Ever. So when you feel like you're about to fall apart, do not run, do not walk. Run to Jesus. Run to Jesus in prayer. Tell him all about it. The Bible calls Jesus the wonderful counselor. Run to him. Run to Jesus in worship. Yes, I know there are times when we feel like we're going to fall apart. Worship gets tough because we'd rather be somewhere else. We've got too many things on our mind and on and on we go. But the presence of Christ in worship is transforming and empowering. Run to him in worship. Run to Jesus in the company of the saints. God brought us here together to be on mission together and we serve each other. We are like spiritual medics from time to time. Run to a believer you know you can trust. Run to Jesus in the Psalms. Listen to other saints of thousands of years ago tell their story of how they felt like they were going to fall apart and how God sustained them. Run to Him. But as you run to Him, remember exactly who you're running to. You're not running to your counselor friend who's been trained, although that's a good thing to do. You're not running to me, although I'd be honored to help you hold it together. You're not running to some random person either. You're running to the king of the universe, unlimited in power, full of grace, who is love itself, who is absolutely committed to you. You are running to him, and you can be confident that he 
will keep your broken pieces together and he will make something of it. I'm reminded of a great story I heard some years ago. They were building a, a testament to a man's love for his de deceased wife called the Taj Mahal, perhaps you've heard of it. And they had this room that was going to be a room of mirrors and they ordered a gigantic mirror to be mounted on the wall. When the mirror arrived, they discovered it was broken. So the engineer did something brilliant. He said, I want you to take that mirror and I want you to smash it into as many pieces as you possibly can. And then they took those pieces and they stuck them to the wall. And the light shining from all those sh uh, shattered pieces fills that room with light. And it is stunning, much more so than if the original plan had been kept. It is said the heart is never whole until it has been broken. This is what God does to our broken pieces. He reassembles them away in a way that brings light and beauty and wisdom and joy. If you feel like you're falling apart, run to the one who can put you back together in ways that make it better than it was before. Run to Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Holy Father, we are grateful for all of your works. We are grateful for Christ Jesus who created everything and the one who is committed to us. Help us to share his commitment to us by commit, being committed to him. And help us to run to Jesus when life goes amiss. And help us to know that he will hold us. For we make this prayer in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Spirit. Amen. Our hymn of invitation this morning is hymn number 282, Living for Jesus. The invitation is Christ's. And the response is yours as we stand. We have a very good day today. 
Fay is coming to join our church by transfer of letter from First Presbyterian Church here in Roanoke Rapids. Do we have a motion to receive Fay? Hearing multiples, no second is necessary. All in favor, let it be known by saying aye. aye. All opposed? Good. Welcome to the family of faith. We have been delighted to see you here for, well, for a while, and we've been getting to know you well, and we appreciate you taking your time to be with us and joining our family of faith. Could I get, I know your friends kind of sit right here. Can I get your, your, some of your friends to come down here and stand with you? I'm going to invite you... Now, this is a traditional Baptist thing to do. We've not done it much because of COVID and, and all that kind of stuff. But if you feel comfortable, I invite you to come in, down this morning and greet Faye and welcome her to Rosemary Baptist Church. All right. Okay. As I like to conclude worship reg regularly, it has been truly good to worship with you this morning. Let's bow now and receive the benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Through Jesus we pray. Amen.